All right, Courtney, we're live. Hi, welcome to our lunchtime mental health 101 today. Um, we have a special guest with us, Felicia Wadsworth. She is the youth programs coordinator at NAMI North Texas. And Felicia, I'll let you go ahead and get started. Thank you, Courtney. As Courtney said, I am the uh, youth uh, programs coordinator here at NAMI North Texas. I've been here just over a year. But first of all, let me say that I am not a counselor, a uh, psychologist, nor a psychiatrist. Uh, I am a retired um, public school teacher of 26 years. I have a bachelor's degree in history and a master's degree in education. And I served on the board shortly for NAMI North Texas before I became the um, youth coordinator here. Um, but I am the parent of a daughter who has been diagnosed with schizophrenia, and I am raising uh, two grandchildren. Uh, so we have a family experience with mental health challenges. And so I'm here today to just talk to you about um, what that means and why do we care? Why do we care about mental health? And so um, that's what we're here to talk about today. So let's get started. So about mental health. Next slide. Mental health, what is it? Uh, the way we think, it's how we feel and how we relate to others. Uh, it's not caused by personal weakness. It um, is not a lack of character or a poor upbringing as a parent. I know that my husband and I, uh, when we first started seeing some struggles with our daughter, uh, we thought it was our fault as parents. There was a lot of shame involved in that. Um, you know, what did we do wrong? I even had people come up to me and say, you must have been awful parents. Well, it has nothing to do with parenting. It is like having uh, diabetes or it's like having heart disease or high blood pressure. Um, it is a spectrum of medical conditions uh, that can impact a person's thinking, their how they feel, their mood. Uh, it can affect their ability to relate to others. It certainly affected her ability to relate to us. We couldn't understand how she was feeling. She couldn't put it into words um, that we could understand. It affected her academic uh, performance at school, not only um, by the time she was a junior in high school, uh, but it uh, derailed her uh, goals that she had set for herself in her life. And genetics as well. Um, my uh, maternal grandmother had some mental health struggles and um, so, and I had an, an aunt who had schizophrenia as well. So it all has an impact on our mental health. So mental health conditions are, like I said, mental uh, medical conditions. Uh, the brain uh, uh, spect imaging, uh, you can see here that the normal brain scan, how it looks, and then depression brain scan looks, certainly looks different, and bipolar brain scan has a different look. And then my daughter, schizophrenia brain scan, and then an OCD brain scan even looks different. So this goes to show the physical or the phys physicality of a mental health uh, challenge uh, is certainly about um, a physical uh, component to a uh, mental health condition. So let's look at the facts. Uh, Eight to ten, between eight to 10 years old, uh, average, average time uh, between uh, symptom onset and treatment. So you've got eight to 10 years of onset before there's ever treatment. Um, number one, uh, mental health um, uh, challenge is depression. Uh, it is the leading cause of disability worldwide and is a major contributor uh, to the global uh, burden of disease. Uh, one in five children and adults living in the United States experience a mental health condition in a given year. 
and one American dies by suicide every 12 minutes. Three-fourths of all lifetime cases of mental illness begin by age 24. Now, she showed signs of schizophrenia by the time she was, I uh, believe, uh, a little later than normal, about 26, but she was certainly depression and anxiety showed up by the time she was about 14. So we kind of knew how to deal with those kinds of things. We saw psychiatrists and psychologists and, and counselors throughout her her high school and junior high and high school years, but um, the schizophrenia episode started to happen after she gave birth to her second child. Um, so those kinds of things uh, we didn't quite understand and certainly uh, we didn't know those symptoms quite that well. And, and so we had some involvement with police departments and so, um, those things can really frighten a, a person who's going through a psychotic episode and uh, and she didn't know how to um, uh, verbalize those issues that she was going through. Approximately 60% of adults with a mental health condition do not receive treatment. And over 90% of those who die by suicide had one or more mental health conditions. Approximately 2 million people with a mental health condition are booked into jails every year. And that is where my daughter is today. She is in jail. And suicide is the second leading cause of death for people ages 10 through 34. My daughter has lived on the streets of downtown Dallas. Uh, she has been arrested recently and is uh, right now in the Rockwall County Jail because she has limited access to mental health care. Texas is ranked 50th for access to mental health care. Stigma is the number one reason why someone does not get help. And when we talk about stigma, we're talking about the patient, certainly, but we're also talking about the family and even our, um, cultural dynamics can also make a play on when to go seek help or how to seek help. I'm open about it now, but my upbringing comes from a very um, closed, we're closed off to the idea of, um, you know, seeking help or talking about it. When you come from an immigrant family, it's very difficult to talk about it. We are shameful. It is shameful to have uh, any sort of mental health challenge at all. We didn't want to talk about it. We didn't want to let anybody know. Uh, you know, you're already, uh, you know, worried about how you're perceived when you have a, um, you know, a, an immigrant family who speaks a different language. You have might have a different religion you practice. So then you have something else like this on top of it. We really want to hide from the outside world. So it's very difficult. Uh, for those of us who come from that background, which is what I came from as well. So stigma is huge, stigma. Access to information, you know, you are limited access to information. I didn't know anything about NAMI North Texas until I was at a, um, a symposium and I heard a speaker from NAMI North Texas and that's how I got involved and heard stigma is the number one reason why people don't seek help. Seeking proper treatment. It may take you a long time to find the right kind of counselor that fits you um, or the right psychiatrist that you want to open up to and, and really figure out what's best for you. But not reaching out is just not the answer that we felt was the answer for us. We looked and looked and looked for the right kind of people to help our family. And relationships. Wow, does that affect relationships? You just want to hide and be, um, you know, in your own little world and not really talk to anybody or, you know, let anyone know what's going on into in your home or in your own life about your own family. And that has a lot of, um, it breaks a lot of relationships with other people. 
and the perception of mental, mental health. We all know that that's getting a little bit better, but it isn't getting as, a, as good as I would hope or that a lot of us would hope. Um, <clears throat> because when you still say you have a family member that struggles with their mental health, that look on some other people's faces is still like, oh, that might be catching. <laughs> well, it isn't. It is okay to talk about it because you're not alone. Because chances are they too have someone in their family or they themselves are struggling. And if you open up, chances are you're going to find out that they have a story to tell as well. So <clears throat> mental health conditions see no color, race or gender. It doesn't see your socioeconomic background, right? So stigma is often greater among underrepresented populations, right? Uh, however, access to, to care in BIPOC uh, communities is often affected. The lack of diversity among mental health care providers, lack of cultural competency among health care providers, language barriers, right? Uh, I know that when you have a lack of insurance, right? Those providers who will not take Medicaid, that's a huge barrier as well. I can't uh, tell you how many times we get calls here at NAMI that want that need access to health to the mental health care, but there's a lack of providers that do take Medicaid or Medicare, right? So those are difficult issues that we we uh, face. Uh, my daughter certainly has faced that. Uh, I myself see a counselor and I go to, uh, I've gone through um, Jewish Family Services to find my own. So it's difficult, very difficult. So let's talk about warning signs of declining mental health, right? Feeling very sad or withdrawn for more than two weeks. You, we all go through moments of sadness and feeling sad, but if it, if it lasts more than, you know, two weeks, then we're talking a little bit more of being maybe depressed and you wanting to be isolating yourself. I know that <clears throat> with my daughter, she would be, she cut herself off from family and friends. She was very gregarious as a, as a, as a child. Uh, so happy go lucky and loved having friends over and going places and doing things. She loved to travel with us at her family and but as time went on, I noticed she liked more of an isolation and and her clothes changed and she became more um, isolated from her very close friends. So then sometimes, you know, that can be a warning sign uh, out of control or risky behaviors that uh, I certainly noticed those as well. Um, sud sudden overwhelming fear for no reason, a racing heart mood swings that caused problems in relationships and she had mood swings that caused a lot of friction between me and her and her dad uh, noticeable changes in behavior personality or sleep she would either sleep a lot or she wouldn't sleep at all and so we kind of thought well she's just a teenager maybe that's the problem we we pushed it off as being a teenager difficulty concentrating or staying still Intense worries or fears that disrupt daily functioning. Preoccupation with food, weight, or exercise. And again, we, we just ticked that off as being a teenage girl, being obsessed with her weight, right? Excessive use of alcohol or drugs. Self-harming behavior, such as cutting, burning, or self-mutilation. And I found out later she was cutting herself. So, and you can, you know, um, sometimes teenage Teenagers can hide a lot from their uh, parents. I felt a lot of shame because here I was a teacher, right? And so I thought, oh, well, I'll know when there's a problem. You don't know unless that person's really willing to share, right? So. So treatment options. <clears throat> Therapy talk therapy, art therapy, CBT and DBT therapy, EMDR, play therapy, pet therapy, non-traditional therapies. We did a lot of talk therapy with her, art therapy, we did some of that, 
certainly play therapy when she uh, was a little bit younger. Um, well, when she was in junior high, there was some play therapy. Um, so you have to figure out what fits you and, and your needs and your um, uh, what you're comfortable with. But a lot of talk therapy did that a lot. Medication, again, that, that takes time, that takes effort, that takes persevering through what you think is working for you, what you don't think works for you. I know with our daughter, right, uh, why she wound up in jail is she accosted a police officer and she was non-compliant with medication, completely non-compliant. When she's compliant on medication and her therapy, she is um, very kind and loving, but when she is off that medication, uh, it's just a whole nother matter. She goes into psychotic episodes and is really not even aware of um, who you are and, and what you're trying to do to help her. Most importantly, the earlier, the better. Um, you know, I wish we could have um, <clears throat> really helped her a little sooner than we did instead of just chalking everything up to being uh, a teenage girl and anxious and nervous about, you know, uh, typical, what we call typical uh, teenage girl type things about boys and weight and mean girls and those kinds of things. I wish we could have uh, recognized some things a little bit earlier. Had I known what I know now, you know, we, we may have treated things a little bit earlier. So positive coping strategies. And so what comes to mind when I say positive coping strategies? Well, things that we love to do, right? Sleep, nutrition, and exercise. I know with myself, if I'm not getting enough sleep, right? Uh, I can really be, <clears throat> I can find the negative pretty quickly. Uh, nutrition, certainly, and exercise, a nice little walk, a five, ten minute walk can certainly improve my mood for sure. Uh -huh. Mindfulness, meditation, yoga. Sometimes when I think of mindfulness, I just think of writing something I'm grateful for. You know, the sun came out today or the sunrise is beautiful, right? I mean, just something very simple. It doesn't have to be this big whatever, this big whoop de do It can just be very simplistic things. Oh, the coffee was really good today. <laughs> you know, I made it on time to my class today. Wonderful. And yoga, if that's what you like, yoga is wonderful as well, right? But think of you. What do you enjoy? Is it a walk? Is it a run? Is it exercise? Is it a good cup of coffee? Is it spending time with your dog or your cat, a good friend, um, getting a phone call from your mother who just wanted to check in on you. It's whatever you enjoy, a good song. So practice self-care. So exercise, sleep, eating healthy foods, uh, seek support, who to talk to, right? There are lots of people that you can who can help you, right? Who you can get the support you need. Parents, I know sometimes that's difficult. I get it. I really get it, right? A trusted adult, friend, professor, uh, college campuses have counselors on staff that you can speak with as well, if that's something that you're comfortable uh, doing. Um, but the best idea is you're just not, you're not alone. Always remember, you are not alone. Those counselors on that campus are there to, to help you. They are there to help you. So what to do if you notice these signs? Reach out to someone that you trust. Always do that. Connect to friends, join clubs and activities on campus. Don't isolate yourself. That's the worst thing you can do. Find healthy, positive coping strategies. Exercise again. Exercise if that's what you love to do. Meditation or playing an instrument can be helpful, right? 
resources. If symptoms persist, find your campus resources like the mental health uh, center, your RA or peer support specialist. So suicide warning signs, take warning signs seriously and take action immediately. And talking about wanting to die or kill themselves. Now look, ask the question, are you thinking about suicide? It's not gonna plant that seed. That seed's already been there. It's already there. So be very direct. Are you thinking about suicide? Looking for, you know, are they looking for a way to kill themselves, such as searching online or buying a gun? Talking about feeling hopeless or having no reason to live. Are they talking about feeling trapped or in unbearable pain? Are they talking about being a burden to others? Are they having an increase in the use of alcohol or drugs? Then seek immediate attention. Ask that question, like I said, are you thinking about suicide? And don't leave them alone. Don't say, oh, well, it's just, eh, they're just messing around. Not if they're talking about it. So the National Suicide Lifeline is 1-800-273-TALK, 1-800-273-8255, or go to the emergency room or call 911. Hey, Felicia, I just want to interject that um, the National Suicide Lifeline has changed over to 988. 988. 1-800 number still works. Yes. But um, 988, if you're in a crisis, hopefully easier to remember, you can call or text um, yes. 988 if you're in a crisis. Or you right. can use this 1-800 number also works as well. Yes, right. Thank you. That's right, Courtney. Thank you. So, again, tips to succeed in college. Maintain and build support systems. It is new. It is different from high school. It is different from those experiences that you've already had. You might have been able to make A's and without even looking at a book, right? Or looking at any notes. It's totally different in college. You do have to look at a book. You do have to look at your notes, right? So it's a very different situation indeed. So it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. It's meant to be tough, right? You're there to learn. You are there to learn. Monitor your symptoms. It is hard. It's different. You're not there with their same friends that you may have had <clears throat> for 10 years, right? In that same school's district that you went to for years. Maintain healthy habits and <clears throat> avoid drugs and alcohol and reduce academic stress. Take a break. Yes, you do have to study, but do take a break. Go for that walk, right? Watch your favorite um, whatever on Netflix or whatever TikTok thing that you might want to look at, but get back to the book, get back to the notes, and take, and, and take it easy on yourself. There's no such thing as perfection, right? Progress, not perfection. Absolutely nothing is perfect, but, you know, Monitor your symptoms. Together we can achieve more. Okay, 11,718 individuals served, right? In 2020, NAMI North Texas Impact Report. Our mission, NAMI North Texas mission, is dedicated to improving the lives of all individuals affected by mental illness through education, support and advocacy programs. We have support groups here at NAMI North Texas, peer to peer, family to family, okay? So, uh, and those are for free. Everything NAMI does is for free, okay? So there have been 195 educational class attendees, 1,450, 15, ending the silence participants, <clears throat> excuse me. And that's what I do 
is set up ending the silence uh, programs for middle school and high school students to talk about ending the silence, ending the stigma of mental health challenges. Okay. Um, so we've had lots of participation and now that uh, COVID uh, restrictions have um, been uh, not quite as restrictive, we've been able to go in person and talk to uh, students um, at their schools and teachers and parents and churches and synagogues. So um, talking a lot more about it opens people up to sharing their stories and ending that stigma. So the four pillars of NAMI North Texas, advocacy, awareness, education, and support. So advocacy, national, state, and local legislative advocacy for system reform, which I'm very involved with, not only through NAMI North Texas, but Dallas area interfaith, awareness, Increasing knowledge and decreasing stigma. I can't say that enough. Let's decrease the stigma through community outreach. I just can't say that enough. And education, no cost. Again, everything we do is at no cost. Educational courses for individuals in recovery and their families. Support. Community building through support groups, helpline and outreach initiatives. Community of support, NAMI connection, family support group, peer to peer, family to family, NAMI basics. We don't do the NAMI home front, but we do do uh, NAMI basics and family to family. That's, that's another thing. I did take the family to family. It helps you understand you're not, the family's not alone either. And the peer to peer is a great program as well, great support group. Ending the silence again, we go to schools and talk about mental health and try to decrease the uh, stigma in our own voice. Um, talking about your own experiences with your mental health. Uh, mental Health 101, North Texas, I haven't taken that one. Uh, NAMI Smarts is about advocacy, done that. It's excellent if you want to try to get involved with making some changes in the whole state of Texas. Mental Health First Aid is great. And then get involved with our NAMI Walk that we have every year in May. It helps raise money for this nonprofit and it helps bring, a, bring about awareness as well. So for more information about NAMI North Texas, you can go to our website, you can call the office. Uh, we even are able to give you some more information about where you can seek counseling if that's what you need or some other areas of, of expertise. We have a long list of places that you can find help. So I appreciate it. So are there any questions? Alicia, I just um, want to say thank you for taking the time to do this mental health 101 presentation with us today. Um, you mentioned uh, mental health first aid near the end of the presentation. And so I just wanted to make um, our viewers aware that we do have a mental health first aid class coming up on Tuesday, September 27th. That'll be at our Denton campus for any faculty, staff or students that might be interested um, in going through mental health first aid. Um, and I want to remind our students and our um, part-time um, faculty and staff too that another resource they have available to them is Timely Care. Um, and Timely Care provides free virtual medical and mental health services, health coaching, um, you know, absolutely free to you and you use your NCTC student email address to get signed up for that. Um, and you can do scheduled counseling or talk now if you're um, feeling overwhelmed or in a crisis. Um, so that's another awesome resource that's out there available to you. Well, I appreciate being asked. 
uh, remember you're not alone um, and use all those resources that you can and uh, don't isolate. If you notice something is, is going on with yourself, please reach out, please reach out. Don't isolate. So thank you for asking. Absolutely. Thank you, Felicia, and thank you all for um, being here with us today. Thank you.